Good morning to everyone. Good morning. So just to let you know that the meeting uh, is recorded. And uh, if you want to speak, you, you need to unmute yourself because it's automatic, automatically muted. Okay, so maybe we can wait another minute just to make sure that everyone joined. Okay, I think we can get started. So, um, good morning to everyone and thank you for joining us in Unwrapping the Digital Divide episode four. So, um, today marks an exciting shift uh, for Digico as we embark on a new phase of this series uh, with episode four that introduced the Lightning Talks series. So these talks are designed to spotlight innovative projects, best practices, and research endeavors uh, aimed at addressing the pressing issue of digital inclusion. In today's digital, uh, digital world, equitable access and participation for all are paramount. Mm -hmm. Our Lightning Talks aim to showcase pioneering efforts, both in Belgium and abroad. We believe uh, these discussions will not only inform you, but also inspire action in our collective pursuit of bridging the digital divide. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Alicia Pavlu Pavluchuk. I'm not sure I pronounce it well, but <laughs> uh, she's a multidisciplinary artist and digital inequalities researcher whose practice intertwines art, community engagement and academia. Her artistic pra practice explores the interplay between research yeah. and creative yeah. interventions for social change. By embracing participatory, intersectional, and experimental approaches, she aims to create space, spaces, communities, and artworks that challenge boundaries and spark meaningful conversations. Her work is grounded in her lived experiences of invisible disability, neurodivergence, and peripheral witnesses as, a, as an Eastern European migrant. She currently works as a research a research fellow at Leeds University, and she's the co-founder of Indo Violence Collective and founder digital and founder of Digital Biz. With over a decade of experience in using art for digital inclusion and digital literacy, she her work is deeply rooted in her commitment to challenging boundaries and sparking meaningful conversation. In today's lighting talk titled "Art and Digital Inequity: How Can Art Be Leveraged for Digital Inclusion?" The speaker will delve into the transformative potential of participatory art and exper experiential learning in digital equity community practice and research. Drawing from her extensive body of work, she will challenge conventional standards and offer alternative perspectives on digital inclu inclusivity. So it's now time to welcome uh, Dr. Alicia uh, Paklut, and she, as she takes um, the floor to guide us into the intersection of art and digital equity. So Alicia, I give you the floor. Thank you so much for introducing me. And I'm kind of, you know, this uh, the introduction of me as a, as a guest has been, uh, yeah, I don't know when, when I wrote it, but it, it feels like it gives lots of promises or perhaps uh, uh, some of them sound like naive assumptions that we can actually, you know, in achieve incredible things through arts. But um, just to say right from the beginning, I'm aware of all of the limitations of, um, you know, my experience and, and, and some of the things that are in the intro. And I will be returning to these throughout the project, uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a really interesting um topic for me because I feel like I have been in between arts and digital equity and community and education for a number of years. And it's only now that I get to, you know, take time and uh, critically reflect on, you know, how that practice has been 
uh, developing in general and how it's changed my attitude and my understanding of how we approach digital equity. Um, uh, as uh, mentioned in this, um, you know, in the introduction, I, I currently work uh, as a researcher at Leeds University, but I do lots of different things as a typical, like, yeah, I'm, my type of neurodivergence is the one where you do lots of different things so you can jump in between them. So, so that's essentially how I do it. Um, let me start with the first uh, slide, uh, and this is um, perhaps a bit unusual, uh, but this is a little video of me hitting um, a, a doll with a keyboard, and um, the doll in itself was covered in glitter and computer parts and all sorts of things. Um, and this was a part of an exhibition that I um, uh, was, uh, yeah, setting up few. I think three or four years ago in the UK. Um, and the idea of this exhibition was pretty much grounded in some of the narratives that we have around digital equity. Uh, this one in particular, uh, let me go to the first, to the next slide, was about uh, gender digital divide, which I was uh, studying at the time uh, when working for um, uh, United Uni United Nations University. And um, yeah, I realized that there's lots of um, assumptions around, you know, girls and how uh, there's there's assumption that there's a confidence problem in the sector. And that's the reason why girls are not digitally included in a meaningful way. So essentially, the whole narrative was about blaming the girls for being digitally excluded and expecting them that they become girl bosses and uh, better versions of themselves, that they empower themselves digitally and out of a sudden the, the world will be fixed. So th this exhibition was like a weird take on um, looking at these narratives uh, and what has been called the neoliberal feminism and um, how we expect that um, girls will just become role models of the future, regardless of the sexism and all the other systemic issues within, you know, the digital skills training or uh, digital access. Uh, so I, um, yeah, you're welcome to uh, to to look at the uh, the full project or parts of it. Uh, it's it's on my website, uh, my artistic website, which is hestera dot online. Um, so. I'm starting with this very weird, you know, uh, exhibition uh, just to showcase that uh, there are different ways art can be done uh, in order to, you know, approach certain topics, as we all know. But um, uh, most of my practice is actually around participatory practice with communities. However, this one was uh, entirely something that I set up, I created, and uh, I used it all as a metaphor for, you know, pinkifying um, keyboards and ensuring that once it's pink, we are fixed, you know, the digital equity uh, or digital gender divide is, is gone. Um, so art, uh, and I would say that art for me within digital equity in itself, uh, and, um, you know, basing on that doll project on Girl Can Do, uh, allows us to uh, take a moment, and I'm really sorry these um, titles are, you know, flying around. I, I didn't intend that. That's my digital skills in progress. They were supposed to just dance once and then uh, just kind of, you know, stare at you. But if you think about um, art and in general, having the time and having the privilege to participate in art activities, it is very often about finding ways to do it in a playful way. And... Uh, co-creating the meaning around how we feel around digital technologies or uh, what digital inequity might mean to us. And arts also allow us to be here and now. So perhaps thinking more about, you know, more um, approaches that are perhaps more about uh, being together and exploring things, uh, not necessarily through digital means, but through art. But let me uh, get into more details later. Um, so... One of the key things that I would like to um, mention here, which I think is crucial to the ideology that we are um, you know, using when we are thinking about digital equity, it is very often about you know, think, thinking about the utilitarian vision of digital skills and digital citizens of the future. And I find it quite problematic in my work uh, you know, as a facilitator, educator, and a researcher, just like with the girls project, the narrative that digital skills are for employability uh, purpose only, which are of course important, uh, are very often um, 
taking us away from some of the very personal spaces and personal narratives around digital inclusion. One of the uh, the big issue that I've had for a number of years and I have been looking at and we are still researching it is around uh, what are we trying to achieve through digital equity programs and digital inclusion? What kind of impact are we looking for? And is this impact even measurable? And how often do we get to the space where uh, the impact in itself is very different to what we were funded to do, right? So I, I, I believe that art is actually providing us with the space to, which allows for this kind of messiness and unstructured, unstructured process and actually provide us with some very unique and uh, important insights into what digital equity might look like in a specific cultural context, right? So it's not all about uh, getting people to work, getting people to work, but actually finding ways to uh, understand their holistic experiences of digital equity. And um, I was going to, you know, quickly maybe say about uh, my personal story and how I ended up uh, in, you know, this this space. And um, it was years ago that I uh, started using uh, participatory filmmaking uh, to understand how communities represent themselves online. Uh, uh, and I was looking at the narratives that were not necessarily in line with, you know, pop culture and um, mainstream media. And at the time, because it was, well, I think, fifth, well, 12 years ago, we were actually using camcorders, you know, and the camcorders allowed us to uh, work with young people, with uh, um, folks with disabilities to, to see their realities and to present their realities. And uh, as you might imagine, for over the you know over the years, instead of using cameras, we started using smartphones. And then smartphones provided us with different ways to do digital storytelling and to really capture the narratives that are happening around us and find so many different creative ways to use these devices. If you know the people that you work with have access to these devices, to to then. Um, you know, think about this community-centered narrative. How do we represent ourselves? How are we being represented? Are we being included, excluded? Uh, to, what, to what extent do we have ownership and agency of all of these digital equity processes? So over the years, my uh, work from, you know, community video worker, uh, it went into research, education, and art. And this is where, uh, you know, mixing all of those things provide me with um, some really interesting um, insights, but also about, uh, it makes me realize that I, you know, even now, uh, after so many years, I realize that I often have so many assumptions when I go into a community space or when I set up an artistic project, I have certain assumptions that this is what it feels like to uh, um, experience digital exclusion or inclusion, right? And I always forget, and I keep getting reminded because of these workshops about the fluidity and unpredictability of these processes when I get the chance to work with communities and to hear from, from them direct, directly about their nuanced experiences of digital uh, literacy or illiteracy or access, you know, all of these um, things related to digital, meaningful digital inclusion. And so over the years, I've also um, set up uh, this organization called Digital Bees. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's still online. However, it isn't amazing. And uh, it's something that I experimented with for a number of years. And more recently, I haven't had the chance to, you know, to to do Digital Bees. Um, uh, but but, but the, the purpose of Digital Bees was actually to think about, uh, you know, how do we connect community work arts, experimentation, and this critical approach to digital skills. And how do we take it from the uh, non-formal education, like outside of the, sorry, how do we take it outside of the formal educational sector and outside of the, the, the narratives that, um, you know, young people need to get these skills, to get jobs. And how do we just like find a way to to, to take a moment and to think about, you know, how do I experience digital technologies on a daily basis? And what does it mean to me? Uh, and over the years, I, I have really experimented with uh, whatever there was available sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes there would be workshops where we arrive and we just use pasta um, to explore our uh, relationship to the dig digital technologies or to ourselves. Because I really feel that this element of emotional literacy um, is something that we don't talk about a lot. And art uh, within digital equity and within art, 
Uh, and here I'm not talking about big forms, important, you know, like traditional ways of, of doing art, but art as a process and, uh, uh, and a community engagement strategy can um, help us to take that moment to actually think and check in with our feelings. I, I would often say it's like taking a mindful moment to, to, to how I feel around my digital experiences. A quick example of the work that I've done with Digital Bees uh, is, you know, all sorts of things. Um, so what I can uh, share with you here is, um, uh, for instance, a, a workshop that we did in Edinburgh with um, young people, kind of just looking at their first morning scroll. You know, like you get up in the morning, you open your smartphone, uh, what is your first scroll like? And we were essentially just using paper and creating like these... Um, it was like, uh, you know, like these washing uh, hanging lines. So it was essentially just like uh, young um, young people were just creating these little moments of their first morning scroll. And they were giving us a tour of their morning scroll and uh, telling us about how these scrolls make them feel and to what extent do they have agency? And is it possible to hack your morning scroll to, to change things? And uh, it was a powerful experience for me, you know, uh, as a youth worker at the time, I've learned about some of the trauma that you can um, experience as a young person going on Snapchat at the time. Uh, and so so, so essentially, that was the workshop. That was us using art for uh, digital equity and digital literacy, right? It wasn't anything massive. It was really just taking paper and taking time and allowing and creating a safe space where these conversations could happen. I'm not going to go into, so, so there are things also like dating your data self. We were thinking about how would I date myself if it was my data, who would I be? And then just looking at the information that we share online. But <clears throat> all of this, um, what we were trying to do at Digital Bees is to find a way not to create this um, online safety fatigue or to come in into the space and say, here is how things should be done. It was really, and I think that's why art is, is so uh, interesting. It was really just about like um, exploration of things and experimentation with things and creating that space where we can uh, explore um, some of these topics. Um, and then when I'm talking about young people, youth centered manner, right? But, uh, and and I think because my um, most of my research is situated within youth work uh, setting. And I also do quite a lot of work around young people's digital inclusion. I know that th these spaces, these non-formal educational spaces are very uh, very much uh, the, the spaces where young people can open up about some of the most challenging and embarrassing issues around their digital participation, whether it's uh, deep fake porn or, or, or some of these uh, things. Uh, you don't go. You don't take them to school, and you don't take them to your home setting. You often go into these, you know, um, alternative spaces. Uh, so, so these are just some of the uh, some of the examples. Um, and I guess uh, in terms of the materials, like I, I have already mentioned, we, you know, I have really used whatever I could, and very often it was actually going into the setting with a set of objects and uh, allowing these objects to do the work, you know, uh, and uh, allowing the group to co-create the artistic activity. Um, tell a story with a pasta about, I don't know, like um, you setting up um, a, a password or um, how do you uh, react? Um, and there's a, a workshop actually that I forgot to mention in this uh, presentation, but um, something happened to me a few years ago where I had, um, um, and it, I can share a link to it after, but I think it might be interested in, in terms of the in terms of um, activity uh, that you might consider as a as a scenario for art. Uh, Four years ago, I think it was at the time of Brexit, I ended up uh, for Christmas in Poland and I had a huge argument with some members of my family around the table. Uh, and there was a time when, you know, Trump uh, got into power and all, all of these things were happening. I think it might have been 2017. And there was a huge argument and there was lots of misinformation around the table. Uh, and I decided, and it was quite traumatic experience for everybody, but then I remember taking all of that and writing a post about it, uh, about the, the the situation that happened around the table at my, you know, with my family. And I used this 
uh and this is me exploiting my family uh, probably well, well they don't know they don't care they love me so but I, I ended up in a misinformation conference and we actually did a role play of um you know with random people about uh there was a role play of me and uh, they, they were the family and so they had to adopt certain assumptions and then one by one we were like trying to figure out like how do you um within that disinformation setting how do you take it step by step? How do you protect yourself around the table? So I'm happy to share. Uh, and it's on my Medium page. There is a there's like a, it was like a pancake of tips on how to uh, protect yourself from someone who is bullying you based on maybe you know uh, different ideology or very often propaganda or disinformation. So uh, this was really interesting, and for me it was also like therapy, right? Uh, using random people to help me to process my uh, disinformation experience at the Christmas table. <clears throat> so I wanted to um, take a moment, uh, even just for us, to like have um, a two-minute exercise. It's it's very very basic. Um, <clears throat> what I would like you to do is to, uh, as you're sitting right now, maybe uh, take an object that is on your right. You see an object that first comes to your mind and then an object that comes to your mind on your left. You don't need to you know, share it. You don't need to show it if you, if you don't feel like it. Um, but really just like the first thing that comes to your mind because uh, what we are trying to do here is to think about these objects of care, the objects that are watching you, the objects that are there for you and that nourish you throughout the day, even if there are random unnecessary things or even if your desk uh, is a mess, which is very uh, common in my case. So uh, within that exercise, I would like us to, uh, I don't, I'm not saying we need to do it, uh, but I would like you to think of this as a, as a proposal perhaps for a workshop that you could run, right? Uh, and here, uh, my proposal is this, right? Uh, how about if we take these two objects together and think about, you know, our digital rituals. So, uh, what do they tell you about your everyday digital rituals and how do they make you feel, right? How do they represent uh, your relationship to your everydayness in the digital world, right? And, you know, I was like really trying hard before this workshop to come up with some like critical question and maybe give it the title and like create a sculpture of these two things. But actually, I realized I didn't have any and I didn't want to push it. And I also realized that if it was in a participatory setting, we would just take these two objects, think about our digital rituals, and then we would maybe give it a title. And then together, we would ask each other questions or tell a story, right? Um, so these could be really random things. And it's, it's something that I've also done in participatory workshops Um you know, where we were adding things to my report, for instance, people would take pictures of their drawings and then we would add them as they go and we would create a collage um, using collage uh, session, um, using Canva with other people is also an option. So um, even if you were if you were to think about, I don't know, experiences of digital equity and things like that. OK. So um, this is like a very, you know, this is just to give you an idea of how you can, uh, I guess, look at what's around you and use that as a creative activity and it could really be anything and so now i'm gonna have a sip of water so i can continue with this <laughs> um so i guess i mentioned that before but there are key things where i um where i think uh, that art allows me and the people that i work with to look at digital technologies from a different perspective and actually sometimes move away from digital technologies and just having conversation about them or having a conversation about a very singular topic, right? Uh, just like a very little thing about um, uh, how does it make you feel when someone, you were expecting them to like your post, but they didn't, you know? What comes through your mind and what are the power dynamics out there and why are people doing it, you know? Uh, and perhaps some people might think, well, this hasn't got much to do with digital equity, but actually I feel that only through these pathways that are more nuanced and uh, uh, more experimental, we can actually learn some new things around digital equity and digital and equity needs. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's several ideas that I had in my mind just now thinking about some of the things that we've done and we've learned, but I'm gonna 
park them for now, <clears throat> not to overwhelm myself and, and you. So um, I guess key things for me are that uh, you can, um, the, the idea of embodiment of digital inequity, right? Actually checking in with yourself and with your body. And I don't feel like um, when we do digital skills training, it's, it's it's important and people, you know, do, there's always this, you know, you have to learn, you are in, in the screen and, but even just understanding people's needs or the reasons why they're, um, you know, one of the key reasons for people not being digitally included is the lack of motivation or not seeing an interest. I mean, it was at, at some point, at least a few years ago, there was this, um, you know, how do we overcome that? And I cannot really see any other way then actually taking a step back and say, like, what are we, how do we, how do we feel about this? You know, why do we not want to engage in these spaces and what's stopping us, right? And I, and I think these mindful moments allow us also uh, for a time where we are um, thinking about emotional liter literacy, uh, which to me is crucial through, like, if you think about the algorithmic reality that we're living in. Uh, because that's something uh, that 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 is something that we don't um, acknowledge very often, and I would just say that um, there has been quite a lot of uh, instrumental research around there, around digital leisure and the importance of digital leisure in everyday life, and how digital leisure should always be considered as a as a as a key part of uh, digital equity programs. Right? Uh, there's been lots of work around. Um, uh, the refugee crisis and understanding how you know technology and meaningful connectivity is actually a, li a lifeline right and it's not just about uh connecting but also about spending time and, and finding ways to survive very difficult moments so there's i think there's the um, un agencies have some interesting uh work around digital leisure uh but that's um i think there's there's more research out there and the final bit is the um the pre-existing impact agendas, which are very often, you know, tell us to uh, take the project in a certain way, and we are working towards a certain towards a certain goal. And I think sometimes uh, art allows us to diverge a bit and actually realize that what we think should matter for a digital citizen might not actually matter in their case, you know. Uh, and it was a really interesting story that I heard the other day about. We someone insisted about uh, you know being able to log in into the class or whatever, uh, and someone said, well, well, actually, the parent of that person has um, issues paying for electricity, uh, let alone the uh, internet uh, connection. So uh, we are talking about meaningful inclusion, but we are not taking time to think about you know these fundamental issues around um, social injustice. So um, now I'm going to just very briefly kind of jump into the work that uh, we are doing at Leeds University right now. And this is with the uh, digital um, uh, inclusion network. It's a, yeah, it's Include Plus Network as a five-year project that I, uh, I, I work with. Uh, and currently uh, we are funded for five years to um, explore the notion of digital equity in relation to certain themes such as uh, civ uh, civic participation, uh, well-being and precarity. And within that, we are exploring the different ways of, uh, you know, uh, digital equity uh, in a very grassroots way or, or and also in a very, you know, down to earth um, understanding of digital equity, right? So I um, I would, um, you know, uh, maybe recommend, um, you know, just checking out the website if you want to learn more about the project, because there's lots of aspects of the project that I'm um, unable to cover in this presentation. What I would like to cover is <clears throat> the art element of it, which I am, I, I feel like I'm in such a, you know, uh, it's like a dream coming true that I, I got a full time job and I get to do research, different parts of research that I love. And I get to, you know, work with incredible communities and artists to set up this particular project. And this project uh, called In Plus Art Iterations is essentially about taking the idea of digital equity into a community setting and connecting community groups with artists and then uh, allowing them to take time to think about the digital equity uh, in a specific and a way that means something to them. 
<clears throat> and uh, what's crucial to this is a set of principles that we have uh, within the network. And uh, these are, and again, you can see them on the website. They're meaningful digital inclusion, collective care, responsiveness, diversity, sustainability, and holistic approach. So uh, through all of the processes that we are um, kind of implementing in our work, we want to make sure that we return to these, you know? And so far, let me tell you that, um, yeah, it's, it's great, right? Talking about collective care and digital equity, but collective care is also, um, has to be situated within certain power dynamics, right? Uh, we can only care so much for someone else, but we also have to care for ourselves. And, uh, you know, so it's, so there's interesting research coming out from, uh, you know, just these uh, principles that we have at the moment. But what we really wanted to do is to invite artists and communities to help us to understand what these principles might mean in their in their worlds. <clears throat> and for now, um, this is uh, we are we've just uh, we've got uh, two projects that have been finished, one in Greece and one in Poland. Uh, we have one happening in Miami next week. Um, and uh, these projects are, are really just uh, something that, you know, I, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what's going to come out of it, but from the conversations that I had so far, it's really, really interesting and fascinating to see how, for instance, the project in um, in, in Greece, um, uh, Thomas Diafas, who, who is an amazing artist, uh, kind of focused on performative art and uh, filmmaking to work with a, a group of people uh, who have both um, were disabled and uh, able bodies uh, about their ideas of digital equity. And some really interesting um, uh, stuff came up, which is very often uh, the case when you give people space, they talk about equity in general, right? It's not just digital, it's 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 just justice. It's not just uh, digital, it's, it's beyond that. And the other workshop was around um, cyber sisterhood in Poland and understanding how um, you know, there are uh, ideas around um, gender-based violence and, and what we can learn from that. So we want these communities to come in and to help us to interpret these um, different principles and then learn from them and then bring them back into the project and understand what, uh, well, understand the process and understand whether um, experiments like that make sense and if they bring value, uh, but not in a very kind of impact agenda set way. Um, so I think this is uh, my last slide. Uh, and I have no conclusion, really. I would love to be able to say that uh, uh, all the things that were mentioned at the very beginning that, you know, art is this powerful exercise and it's going to change the world. We all know that art very often is for the most privileged and uh, I feel very privileged to be able to make art right now it's because I have a full-time employment but part art participation like digital equity um, activities are uh, need to be framed within the, the system uh, the power dynamics uh, so no false promises here uh, but I'm open to any questions and uh, I'm happy to reflect on on some of the things that I shared and I hope some of it was um, informative. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, this presentation and all your work is is amazing and super interesting. And I I really think it's definitely innovative compared to all the other uh, efforts on digital inclusion that we are all uh, quite used to to see around. So um, now there is the Q and A session. So if you have any question or curiosity that you would like to ask to our to our speaker, feel free, please, to either write it on the chat or directly jump into the conversation. Just remember to un unmute yourself before before speaking because otherwise we won't hear you. So um, the floor is yours if you want. Well, I can start to break the ice. Uh, so Alicia, um, how can organizations or communities without 
extensive artistic resources for themselves, still leverage art for digital equity initiatives? Um, yeah, I think this is this is a valid question because how do you not make um, the process uh, exploitative? Uh, but I would say that there's always an artist in the community that you can partner with and finding a ways to, uh, you know, maybe uh, create a space where you can both benefit in, in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> but I would also say that um, there is tons of, um, you know, uh, maybe looking into public and participatory arts practice uh, in general and uh, getting some ideas out of it, uh, or even just even, I don't know, asking chat GPT, you know, like what are some of the activities that we, we could do? And I think uh, that there will be resources there. Uh, and yeah, and I think when we talk about resources, obviously there's 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 time, there is money, there is uh, ability. Uh, so I feel it is about maybe before jumping into an activity, finding a way to understand how the community would like to experience that. So for me, this is more about uh, finding resources in terms of time and patience, not to jump in into something that is supposedly innovative and fun without actually consideration for the community and say, actually, oh, we don't want to do this. This is silly. We would rather just do something very different. So perhaps um, I'm not giving you a straight answer here, I know, but... Um, yeah, of course, there is no straight answer in uh, in these cases, as, yeah. as you mentioned before, with with the no conclusions <clears throat> conclusion. And uh, thank you very much. I think this is inspiring for any organization or community that would like to leverage art mm -hmm. within their activities. And it could also be interesting for the participants uh, of these initiatives. So like maybe vulnerable people that are attending some digital inclusion programs to feel more included if they can maybe express the, themselves through some artistic uh, initiatives, no? It could also be- yeah, um... and I, yeah, and I don't think like you need to think of these as, oh, it's either or, or that you're gonna just have an art activity uh, on this, but <clears throat> perhaps there's a way to find 10 minutes before you actually jump in into the hardcore, you know, digital skills learning where you take a moment and where you like check in with the group somehow, like, how are you feeling about this? Um, and I guess sometimes it could just be like one of those um, warm up exercises, uh, which which you do in, in, in non-formal education anyway, right? So um, I guess it is about creating this, uh, this safe space and um, yeah, and allowing for thing, things to happen without uh, enormous expectations, right? That it's, uh, I think innovation is a, such a big word and like, you know, we all want to create innovative things, but I, but I really see it as more like a community building and, and opening up space and giving people time to, to, to do things. <clears throat> Great. Uh, we have a question from Norman. Do you see digital skills and competence gaps as a barrier for such initiatives to reach those most affected by digital inequities? Mm. Um. Um. Hmm, I don't know how to approach this question. So it's. Um. I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always a barrier, um, but I wouldn't say that be, you know, I mean, to take it down in general, the more socially excluded you are and <clears throat> disadvantaged you are, it is quite clear that it's, it's going to be very difficult to find you in the community and to get you into something. So it really is... Um, it's all connected, right? The the social injustice with the digital inequalities. But uh, I would say that uh, it's not like directly correlated because digital skills are, um, everybody has, yeah, it's, it's just different programs, it's different initiatives. I'm just thinking about the range of um, workshops that I've done and we've done a group um, with, with older adults, um, and they just had different experiences. And because I was in this very privileged position where I wasn't meant to be delivering certain digital skills assessment at the end, I could really focus on, on their needs. 
So I don't, I think when you're focusing on the digital skills assessment criteria, yes, that's obviously a barrier, but a barrier for, for what? I'm just, I'm just trying to understand because within the art uh, experience, um, I guess there's uh, different expectations. But yeah, I would say, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm, hmm, because I don't think there is a one type of initiative that I would share, right? Because I have done so many different initiatives uh, that's, yeah. Maybe to, to specify a bit um, what, what I mean by the question yeah, is um, when you try to deliver an initiative where you work with uh, digital tools to engage people, to get them more included, um, is it something that you face that because the, of the background that these people have, they also very often have you know, digital competence gaps where they don't necessarily know how to use tools or don't have experience in using these tools. And is that yeah. something that you run into as an issue in, in trying to, you have this great idea to do something, but yeah. then you can't quite manage because the people you're trying to do it with don't don't know how to, to do it. That was kind of the yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That's Because, you know, I've, I've just realized that I probably haven't used much um, digital tech in these uh, workshops that these were mainly workshops uh, with like arts and crafts, you know, and uh, yeah, I remember we're uh, running this uh, uh, one workshop, well, a few workshops when I worked with the um, it's a um, Scottish Travelers Educational Program, and they work with traveling communities, and they uh, essentially. I, I guess there's different criteria, right? You do know that you need to bring your um, a set of iPads and you need to bring, uh, because we were working with digital technologies there, you need to ensure that you provide people with data. So the activity uh, and, and the right support. So I guess there is a different checklist, right? Uh, and you do have to um, create this um, workshop around around the needs that they have and um, maybe focus on, on a little thing that we would just do on an iPad. Um, and I think, yeah, this is an important consideration, of course. Um, but uh, I think because my experience was mainly using, um, yeah, non, uh, non-digital stuff. And, and, it's, and it's interesting because People who always say uh, it's, it's interesting, right? Any digital inclusion workshop that you start with a community, everybody is like, "Well, I don't know anything about digital technologies. You know, nothing. I'm not into digital technologies." But then, when you dig into it and you start having these conversations or like play with something, people have so many opinions and they have so much expertise and this lived experience. I think it's like the most important thing within digital equity. It isn't about what we expect people to like tick boxes. But this lived experience. Um, so yeah, if you are approaching it with digital technologies in mind, I would say, of course, it's a different workshop and a different. Uh, you need to kind of approach it differently than just arts and crafts, which is my favorite. You know, <laughs> so. Thank you very much, Thank you for Alicia, the question. both for for the your responses and for sharing your yeah. amazing experience and work in uh, in this specific topic um i hope you everybody enjoyed the the webinar i will send you uh, an email with the with the recording and as well as the the links to alicia's work so that if you if you would like to like go deeper on what she's doing you you can um Thank you for joining us, and we we wait for for you to the next episodes. We will have one uh, lightning talk per month in the next couple of months. So you're very welcome. Okay. Yeah, and, th thank and thank you, you so much, much for having me again. And, and feel free to check the um, the, the website uh, for the Include Plus Network because I think we have some little funding for a little project as well coming up soon for digital equity programs. So it might you know um, you might no groups that might need it so um and yeah feel free to contact me directly i'm not like i won't promise that i will get back to you right away but uh, i will try my best <laughs> so thank you thank you very much have a nice day <laughs> thanks bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. bye.